So, so hello everyone and welcome to DSC AUB. Um, I'm Amar Khodar and I'm the DSC lead uh, for AUB. So this session is going to be uh, an introduction to machine learning. Uh, you don't need any prior knowledge in ML for this session. So our goal, our, our goal for this session is to demystify some of the core concepts of machine learning, um, you know, talk about uh, what it is, um, how it is that a machine could be learning, how it is that an algorithm can learn exactly, and what training models are, um, what the different types of machine learning are, and how are they applied, and we'll be looking at some specific examples of those as well. We're also going to have a practical part of the session uh, where you can see ML in action being applied in code, and we'll be sharing the coding notebook with you guys as well so that you can uh, follow along and see it in action. So our speaker for today is Julia Zini. She is a PhD candidate at AUB uh, in electrical and computer engineering, and she has four years of experience in several machine learning concepts, uh, fields rather, ranging from clustering and linear regression to supervised and reinforcement learning. Um, so she's going to be the, giving the session today. I'm definitely not qualified for that. So, so from now on, I'm just going to leave the floor to uh, Julia to give the session. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Omar. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Julia Zine. I'll give you the workshop today. Uh, please feel free to send me your questions over chat or ask me any questions anytime uh, during the workshop. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen. I think you can see it now. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So first of all, the first question that we ask is what is machine learning? We know that this is a trending topic. Everybody loves machine learning applications, uh, loves to talk about machine learning, but I see few people really know what machine learning is, uh, is indeed. So basically, we want to teach the machine or the computer to perform a specific task without explicitly using instructions to tell the machine how to perform this task. So basically, one of the major um, uh, data sets in machine learning that everybody in the commun community knows is the MNIST data set. MNIST data set is um, about digit recognition. So we have written uh, digits and we want to recognize them. If I want to um, define machine learning uh, on the MNIST data set, I would say the following. I want to teach the machine to tell me that this is a zero, this is a two, this is a four, without telling it that zero is basically a loop, two might consist of a loop at the end, three is written as like two semicircles. I don't want to give these explicit instructions. I want the machine to just know that from examples or from human experience. So uh, the main the main component of machine learning is data, and this is uh, this is what's uh, what we're gonna cover uh, next. So basically, we just learn from observation or data, um, uh, and these are the explicit instructions if you want for uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, for a machine learning algorithm and the algorithm will try to look at the patterns in the data so it will look at two uh, many examples of two and it will figure out somehow with some magic that we're gonna um, introduce today how uh, is the pattern uh, uh, done inside uh, our data set so um we see nowadays many, many, many applications of, um, of machine learning. Um, the speech recognition, uh, the recommender systems, the uh, autonomous driving cars, many computer vision, applica computer vision applications. But we need to know that all of these applications, no matter how wide the range is, basically all of these applications, they fall under one of the three categories of machine learning. The first category is the unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning um, it does not have any supervision. So mainly it just, it just tell, uh, tells you that these two things look alike. For example, if you, wo if you watch a Netflix uh, movie, Netflix would suggest a different movie for you to watch. 
But no one told Netflix that these two movies really look alike. So there's no supervision. Just Netflix knew that from either uh, that these two movies uh, have the same actors or uh, they have the same genre or um, maybe one user that watched this movie already liked another movie, so they suggested to you. So the, the main idea behind unsupervised learning is that there's no supervision. It only deals with, with distances between two uh, data instances. The, the second type of uh, machine learning uh, uh, applications or algorithms is uh, the supervised learning. So in the supervised learning, clearly there is a supervision. There's someone that told me this thing and this thing and this thing, this thing they are all, let's say, double cheeseburger. So in the, next, I, uh, in the next iteration or during the testing phase, I would know that this is a double cheeseburger. So basically, there is a supervision in, uh, in, in, this, um, in this type. Uh, let's say digit recognition is one of these applications. And finally, um, this is the dearest to my heart, uh, reinforcement learning. I worked a lot on, uh, on reinforcement learning. Uh, it's the most interesting machine learning um, uh, field uh, because it's the true hope of machine learning. So basically, it, is, it has a very uh, a great potential, uh, but it's very hard. So this is one of the hardest machine learning uh, uh, frameworks, which is the reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning basically learns from experience so um and by reward so it it, it learns uh it learns the application the same way we human uh learn uh, in, in life so basically if something gives me a high reward i will be most likely doing it for uh, the second and the next time if it doesn't give me a high reward then most probably i will avoid doing this action so basically reinforcement learning deals with decisions and actions and it's based on uh on reward during this, uh, this workshop, definitely we're going to focus on one type of machine learning algorithms, and I'll be focusing on supervised learning. It's one of the things that you will learn uh, first in any machine learning course, uh, basically. Uh, I, so, so, Julia? Yeah, um, sure. Someone's, someone's asking in the chat uh, if you can give an example about reinforcement learning. So how can, how can someone reward a machine exactly? Yeah. So... Um, in reinforcement learning, let's take an example, uh, any game that we used to play as kids, or we can take as an, as an example, a maze, the Pac-Man game. Uh, basically, games are, are a great example for reinforcement learning. Let's say Pac-Man game. So if I have a Pac-Man game, my goal is to uh, reach a certain point in the maze while avoiding the ghosts on the way. So if I am the one who's programming the game, I would give a negative reward every time I approach the ghost. So basically, the score will be negative or the score will be a small number. However, every time I approach a, a dot or what was it, Yanni, something that you can uh, uh, eat in the game, I would give a high, uh, high score, which is the reward. So with time, the, the Pac-Man will, will learn that Every time I'm approaching this ghost, I'm, neg I'm getting something that's negative. So I, I, I shouldn't go there. With time, it will learn to do the, the correct actions uh, that will lead to the uh, to high reward. The same way that we teach uh, children, basically. Is this, okay? Is this clear? Yeah, and chess is a great example also of... Uh, of reinforcement learning. Um, it was recent, Yanni, I think 2017, that the first reinforcement learning agent won over the uh, world champion in, in the game chess. So that's why I said that reinforcement learning has really the true potential in, uh, in machine learning. Uh, it's, it's with reinforcement learning that we, we can really solve big, uh, big problems that, uh, that, that are still uh, areas where the human is doing better than, uh, than the machine. Okay, um, so I need to say something about this workshop. Definitely in two hours, I can't cover uh, deeply and with theory the algorithms of, uh, of machine learning. I'm just giving you an idea uh, about the main machine learning concepts. 
so that you can go and learn it in, in next workshops or learn it on your own. We'll definitely have a hands-on session. We'll do something. But I just want you to know that there are many details in every algorithm I'm going to explain that we need to take care of in order to be better data scientists or data engineers. So uh, uh, I'm quoting here Einstein that you know, I need to explain things simply. Uh, that means we really understand them uh, well, uh, well enough. So it's just a friendly introduction to basic ML concepts. Uh, I hope you will, uh, you will like it. However, uh, 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 you need to really dig into the details to become better uh, machine learning uh, experts or data scientists. Uh, we will focus on supervised learning. Basically, we'll do a background and we'll formulate two main uh, machine learning problems. And we will do a hands-on session using Google uh, Colab, which is super easy and super friendly. Uh, we'll, we'll set the ground for the Federated Learning Workshop by just giving a few examples. And maybe Omar can talk about the, the Federated Learning Workshop at the end of, uh, of today. The tools that we learn is SQ, uh, that we'll use, basically, is first SQ, uh, SKLearn for the, the linear regression, and we'll use Keras mainly for the neural network. Now, Keras is based on TensorFlow, so we're not going to uh, uh, write TensorFlow code directly because it's much harder than Keras, but we should know that Keras has a TensorFlow uh, backend, so we're using it uh, explicitly. Okay, any questions? Okay, so uh, we already covered the introduction. We're gonna uh, focus on the machine learning process. So usually what are the main steps that uh, anyone in machine learning should follow? Um, I'll take the first algorithm, uh, which is the linear regression, which is one of the first algorithms that we usually learn in, in machine learning. We'll do the first hands-on session. Then we'll do the next uh, famous and interesting topic on, on neural networks. Uh, we'll have a second hands-on session. And finally, we'll conclude with, uh, with introducing uh, challenges in, in AI. So uh, I'm not monitoring the chat. So if there is any question, maybe Omar can unmute. Uh, about tools available to download, to use them. They, we just, we, we will use Colab. So uh, the libraries are already loaded inside the Colab environment. We don't need to download anything. Um, so the ML process. Any machine learning application should go through these five steps. So this uh, process is for um, uh, for any application that, that's dealt with by, by ML. The first component is to get the data. And this is the main part. Whenever I have a student in a workshop or in a course that has an interesting project, the first question that we ask, do you have a data? Can you get a data? set for this uh, for this uh, application so basically uh, as we said earlier data is really the most important part of any machine learning application we need to take care of our uh, data set so this is one and then we have this data set we need to clean it prepare it manipulate it for uh, implementation then we need to train uh, our model so we need first to choose a model and then train it once we train our model, we need to test it in real environments, on real data, in real scenarios, and report this uh, testing uh, performance to the client or the user. And finally, we need a lifelong improvement uh, on our, uh, on our uh, machine learning algorithm. So um, we'll start by the first, um, sorry, the first step is um, get the data. So I just wanted to, to uh, introduce this, uh, this slide uh, to just highlight the importance of data in any machine learning application. Really, data is the most important part, getting good data and getting uh, enough uh, data for our machine learning. And we, the, the, I, I'm sure you know about the saying that data is the new oil. In the future, countries will fight over data. And, and we've seen already some problems about uh, privacy issues, storage issues, and so on. So really, data is a very important part that we need to, to think about before starting our uh, machine learning uh, application. So where do we get data from? If we're lucky, someone will give us ready 
to use data. So someone will give you uh, an Excel file, I don't know, a CSV file, just deal with this data set. Otherwise, if we have our own, let's say, idea for an application, uh, for uh, entrepreneurship, for um, a, a new, a new uh, innovative ideas, we need to go and collect data sets ourselves. We can do interviews with people to know their idea about a certain topic. We can ourselves uh, observe data. Let's say we're doing uh, uh, temperature forecasting. We need to observe temperature, pressure, and so on, and we need to save them. We need to prepare our data set. We can do surveys um, to just collect data from people. Uh, we can use a uh, usage data, which is basically data that's stored on websites and big companies. We can buy this this kind of data and use it, and use it. And we have focus groups on on getting us our data sets. So this is for like new ideas or new applications. If you have your own plan in machine learning that you want to to proceed with, you need to collect your own data. However, if you're in the machine learning field and you already um, uh, you're lucky enough, uh, let me say you're lucky enough to uh, let's say invent your own machine learning algorithm or to improve on some existing algorithm, you you want to go to some well-known data sets that are used in the community and just use them to be able to compare. So, for example, the MNIST data set that you already talked about is one of these very well-known data sets. Uh, we have the CIFAR data, which is basically, uh, it has um, uh, general uh, labels, for example, truck, car, flower, um, airplane, and so on. It has uh, two, two versions, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. 100 has 100 classes and CIFAR 10 has just 10 classes. Uh, so these are the data sets that we can, that are already defined in Keras. We don't need to download them. Keras will do that for us. Uh, and they're, uh, they're easy to, to manipulate and use and they're well known. So today we're going to use MNIST data set in our hands-on session too. So, okay, we got the data. We need to know what is the type of my data. We have many data types. First, if we're lucky, we have a numerical data set. So we call it tabular data set. So let's say the, the, the temperature forecasting is an example of numerical data or sales. Let's say I want to predict sales in terms of advertisement and uh, prices and I don't know. So this is a numerical data set. It's easy to use. This is one of the easiest data sets. The second type, which is really interesting also and really famous, the image data uh, data set. So image consists of pixel values that are basically numbers, so we, can, we know how to deal with them. And many computer vision applications already deal with uh, image data. So it's, uh, it's also easy or uh, we know how to deal with, it, with this data set. We have the textual data, basically the autocomplete on your phone, or on your phone uh, the spe uh, speech recognition, no, but uh, let's say the translation deals with, with textual data. Many applications deal with textual data. The first problem with textual data is that text is not a number. So if I have an algorithm, I can't apply it directly on text. I need to do some pre-processing steps to, to transform this um, it is the, the string into a number. And this is beyond definitely the scope of this workshop, but it's interesting to uh, just go and uh, read about it. Uh, we have the speech data, uh, which is basically a signal. So uh, also it's numbers, we can't deal with it. We have the graph data, which is yani, recently it's going famous and trending and, and so on. Uh, graphs for social networks, let's say uh, Facebook data, any, any big social network is basically a graph. How to deal with graphs in machine learning algorithm. And this is a big uh, re um, uh, area of research and it's very interesting. In this workshop, the first hands-on session will do numerical data and the second hands-on session will do image data. So, uh, the, the rest is, is obviously beyond, uh, beyond the scope of, of this workshop, but I wanted to introduce them. So, in, in preparing and manipulating data, I have many, many steps. And this, is, this might be like a workshop on its own. So, what do I do if I have one missing value in my data set? Do I replace it with zero? Do I replace it with the average of other values? Do I replace it with minus one? Do I keep it as none? What do I do? So, this is like one uh, step. Usually, we replace it with the average, for example. 
We have feature scaling. If I have my features uh, uh, with a very wide range, what do I do? Sometimes I have outliers. Let's say I'm, I'm classifying cancer versus non-cancer. So one of the patient, his, his, um, his history is really perfect, but he has cancer. So this is an outlier. What do I do with outliers in my, uh, in my training or in, in the process of machine learning? Should I keep them? Should I not keep them? So this is another question and this is another um, debate here. Uh, we need definitely to anonymize our data. So privacy is a big issue. Uh, let's say we shouldn't upload the names of maybe customers. Uh, we need to, to deal with privacy issues. And finally, we need to, uh, once we're done with every uh, manipulation step, we need to split our data into train, validation, and test. In this workshop, we will focus definitely on, on this step. This is uh, a must in every, uh, in every uh, machine learning algorithm. So what do we uh, mean by train validation test? Also, there is no ma math behind the 60-20-20, but it's a rule of thumb and it's used in, in machine learning. So basically, we split our data into these three categories. The first one is a 60% of the data set. It's the training data. Um, training data means that this is the data that I will feed to my algorithm in order to learn the, the dependencies and, and, and the features or the patterns in the data. So I just feed it 60% of the, my data. The 20%, uh, the second 20% is basically once I train my model, I might modify something in my model and test it again. I might choose a different model and train it again and so on. So we do this second evaluation on the validation data set. We're gonna come back to this uh, to this slide uh, with, with neural networks, but I, I, I need to, to explain it uh, before. So basically we change the model and we test on the validation data set. And finally, I choose the best model. I get uh, a certain accuracy. Let's say I, uh, I get a 90% accuracy. Once I need to give this model to the user or to the client, I don't give the model with a 90% accuracy, no. I need to test my model on a separate data set, which is the testing data set, which is a 20% of my data. I need to test uh, my model on these 20%, and then I need to report the accuracy on this testing data. I don't report the accuracy on any uh, data set that's seen during training. And uh, you might know, you might ask why. Um, basically, the testing data is never encountered during training, meaning that it looks really like real data that's not seen before, the data that the user will basically use. So that's why I need to be honest with my user or client and report my accuracy or my performance on this data set that, uh, that's, not, that's not seen before. So as a first take home message from this workshop, do not uh, test on data that's seen during training slash validation. Just test on completely new data set. And if you test, you can't go back and change the model. Testing data is just for testing, for reporting the final accuracy. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So, um, the third, uh, the third uh, step in the process is to train the model. So first, we need to understand what is a model. Uh, let, we said we're going to focus on supervised learning. So in supervised learning, the goal is to output, uh, to output a certain label. Yani I have an input x. I need to say that this x is 0. This x is 9. If, if, we're, if we're doing uh, digit recognition. So basically, I need to output a certain prediction y for every input x. Now, there are two types of supervised learning, um, supervised learning uh, uh, applications. If y, the, the, the output I'm going to predict, is a continuous value, let's say the temperature, the price, the sales, and so on. So if I'm predicting a continuous value, I say that the model is a regression model. So uh, it, it's, uh, it can predict any value, basically. The temperature could be uh, 30, 31, 32.5, it can be anything. 
If y is a discrete or a binary value, let's say in, in, uh, in case of discrete digit recognition, for example, so we're, we're outputting a number between 0 and 9, uh, an integer between 0 and 9, or if it's a binary value, I'm just predicting whether the email is spam or not spam, I'm predicting whether the patient has cancer or not, then the model is a classification model. Today, we're going to deal with the classification in the second hands-on session and with regression in the first hands-on session. So formally, a model is a function. It's simply a mathematical function F that the one, like the one we, we were uh, using uh, when we were in high school. So basically, it's just a function F that takes an input X and predicts a value Y. In the slides, and usually in, in all machine learning courses, you don't see Y, you see Y hat, meaning that it's the predicted value, it's not the true value. So I'm just predicting a value for X, we call it Y hat. How do, how do we train a model? So to train a model, meaning that to output this function F that I don't know, I first need to choose a training algorithm. What's the algorithm I'm gonna use? And there are many training algorithms in, in machine learning. This algorithm needs to minimize a, lo a, loss, a loss function or a certain error. So it needs to uh, do predictions that are uh, really good, that the error is really small. So we're minimizing a certain error function. We call it the loss function on the training data. So all of this is done just on the training data. I don't look at the testing data during training. So we are already familiar with what training data means. We also need to define the, what do we mean by a training algorithm and what do we mean by a loss function. Training algorithm, this is a very, very, very important picture. So it tells me what's the difference between a model and a training algorithm. So basically, the model takes x, outputs y. And this is my ultimate goal. I don't have the model yet. If I have the model, my problem is solved. So my aim here is to compute this model f. That's why we have training algorithm that will output the model for me. And to be able to output the model, I need x, y pairs. So I need previous knowledge, previous examples from human experience that the training algorithm will be trained on in order to output my model F. And this is really important. So we shouldn't, um, uh, uh, we should differentiate between the model and we shouldn't confuse the model with the training algorithm. I'm gonna go back to the slide once we're at the neural network to explain uh, in the application of neural networks what that, what's the difference between the model and the training algorithm. So as a second take-home message, we need to know that the training algorithm will not output the, the quantity I want to predict. So my training algorithm will not tell me that the temperature tomorrow is 35. No, it will tell me that this is the model that you should use. For the model, you give the input and the model will give you a temperature 35. This is a very clear distinction that we should make before we proceed. So what are these machine learning algorithms that we are going to use? The linear regression is one algorithm, logistic regression, decision trees, artificial neural networks, which uh, and deep neural network, KNN, and so on. Um, there are many, these are all shallow uh, learning methods we call. This is not deep learning. Build deep learning, there is also, uh, there are also a lot of uh, machine, of algorithms. For now, we're just uh, in this workshop, we are going to do linear regression and uh, neural networks. Sorry, I'm highlighting here logistic regression. I should highlight uh, linear regression. So um, now that we know what an, what an algorithm is, we need to know what is the loss function. Um, so just if, if you lose me at six, maybe it will be an electricity problem. I'm not sure, but just to, to let you know. Uh, so, what's the, uh, the, the, the training algorithm will put assumptions on F, let's say it's a linear function, we'll see it in, 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 uh, in details next, uh, and it searches for the function or the model F that minimizes a certain loss function. The loss function will be the error between the predicted values and the true values. So I have my training data, 
I need to do a model that minimizes what the, the, what the model will predict, the difference between what the model will predict for my values and what the true values are. So mathematically, if we want to define a loss function, uh, let's say we're dealing with mean absolute error, it will be the summation for all my data between the true prediction of this x by the model and uh, sorry, the prediction of uh, x by the model and the true value of x uh, in life. So I'm just um, doing the difference between these two values inside an absolute value and I'm doing the sum over n, yani I'm doing the average. So this is one kind of loss function, which is the mean absolute error. If we just square this item here, it will become a mean squared error. And usually we deal with mean squared error because it's differentiable and it's smoother. Uh, so we don't do absolute error because absolute error, uh, absolute value is not differentiable at zero. So this is a detail, but we just use uh, MSE. There's another um, advanced uh, loss function. I think we're gonna use it in the hands-on session, which is the cross entropy loss. It's basically fancier, but it's nothing. We're just doing the log of the prediction multiplied by the actual value plus one minus the actual value multiplied by log of one minus the prediction. Any questions till now? Okay. Um, so in the process, we did one, two, three, the steps one, two, three. Uh, excuse me, Julia. Yeah? Uh, someone's asking a question saying, can the training algorithm output multiple models? Um, no, basically, when we train, we output one model. We're gonna get back to this. Uh, we can uh, we can train on multiple models and choose the best model, and we can train on multiple models. And then the, the end the end model would be uh, we call it ensembling. So we like we merge the prediction of multiple models. But just one training algorithm will output one one uh, one model for for the time being. Okay. Um, yeah, so we did steps one, two, three. We still have four and five. Basically, testing is, uh, as we said before, and as we insisted on this, and then we report that uh, performance on the testing data, which is not encountered during training. We should uh, uh, test on our training or validation data. And for the improvement, there are many, many ways to improve our models, transfer learning, multitask, and so on. Definitely, it's beyond the scope of this workshop, but you can uh, go ahead and read or ask me about them uh, at the end of, uh, of the workshop. Okay, so let's get back to the real, uh, real work. We're going to start with linear regression, which is one of the machine learning uh, models that, uh, that we can uh, use. So uh, let's, uh, let's define first the data set that we're going to use in the slides. We're going to use a different one in, in the hands-on session. So let's assume that I have, uh, I want to predict the sales in million euros um, based on the amount I put on advertisement. So basically in year one, I, I spent, oh, this company basically spent 23 million euros on, on advertising and then uh, the sales were 651 and so on. I have these numbers for nine years. I want to know next for year 10, if I pay a certain amount on advertising, uh, what is the amount of sales that I would get? So each row, and this is a typical data set, all the data sets uh, that we're going to deal with, and basically all data sets in machine learning, numerical data sets, they look the same. So every row represents, we call it one instance. So for every year, this is one example that the machine will take and learn from. And every column is basically an input or a feature. So uh, my input is the advertisement. My input is the year. And I have one column for the output, which is uh, the sales. So this is the quantity of interest, we call it, yeah, and the thing that I wanna predict. And um, maybe I should have kept this uh, as a question. So basically, this is a regression problem because the sales could be any number, it's continuous, it's not a fixed value. Okay, so this is not a classification problem, this is a regression problem. So we have this data set. 
I uh, what I can say about this data set is, is that it's really simple. So I just have two numbers, maybe the year and the advertising. And from these two numbers, I want to predict one number. So this is not a hard data set, and I don't have a lot of data. It just fits in memory and, and so on. So maybe the model that we should use for this data set should be also easy. One of the easiest machine learning models, and uh, it's really basic, uh, the linear regression. But uh, surprisingly, it does well. Yani. Sometimes it's really a good, uh, a good model. So linear regression is one of the simplest machine learning algorithms, and it is inspired from statistics. Even before machine learning, people used to know about and used to use uh, linear regression. So from its name, linear, we know that it we know that the linear regression model will represent the output y in terms of the inputs. We call them also features x1 till xn linearly as follows. So my predicted output would be a certain weight times x1 plus a certain weight times x2 and so on. Just to make this line um, more general one, yani we don't have the constraint that this line must pass through the origin. We add this coefficient beta zero. Otherwise, we're forcing our line or our hyperplane to pass through the origin. This is the cause that we have this beta zero here. So beta one, uh, beta zero till beta n, I call the model coefficients. So these are the things that are not known. If I know beta one, to, uh, beta zero till beta n, then whenever I get a certain output, I would multiply it by these numbers and I will get my predicted value. So no, I don't have them. I need to compute them. And um, that's why we call them the model coefficients. Beta zero is a special coefficient that's called the intercept. Uh, meaning that we will see it in the, in the hands-on session, meaning it's the number where my line um, intersects the uh, y-axis. Y That's why we call it the intercept. It just has the uh, special name. So I want you to take like one minute and try to answer these two questions. What is the goal of the linear regression model? And what is the goal of the linear regression algorithm during training? I'll monitor the chat if you want to... Uh, um, answer. Okay, the model is used to predict the output y and the algorithm. So Zainab said that the model is used to predict the output y, which is the sales. The algorithm is used to predict the model, or more, yes, true. More specifically, what's in the model specifically I want to know? Exactly, the coefficients. So basically, the model it will predict y hat in terms of x1, xn, such that the predicted y hat is close enough to my actual y. And the algorithm during training will predict the coefficients beta 0 till beta n, which are basically the model. So the model is nothing but these coefficients. If I know these coefficients, then um, everything is solved. OK, so that's good. The question now, how to compute these coefficients beta 0 till beta n. So we need to minimize the difference between the true y and the predicted y hat. I, and I have n training data points, yani n rows, and I have n inputs and columns. And we need to find beta 0 till beta n that minimize. Don't be afraid of the math, OK? So we just need to minimize the difference between y hat the predicted and y the true value. Um, this should be squared. Oh, yani for now, it could, be, it could be squared. It could be absolute value. So we're just using any error function, not specifically the square uh, function. If I replace y hat by the one that the linear regression model gives me, this one, I will arrive at this formula here. So basically, I'm minimizing y minus beta 0 uh, plus beta 1, x1, and so on. For this, we use the least squares method, which is really well known in statistics and in machine learning. And it's really used in, in linear regression algorithms. 
I'll, I'll do that quickly. Um, now before the least squares, I'll, I'll show you um, uh, graphically what do we do uh, in, in, this, uh, in linear regression. So basically, this is the line that I want to predict. It's a line because it's a linear regression model, so it's linear. This is the line I want to predict, and these are my training data points. I want to minimize the difference between the predicted value that's here, the intersection on the line, and the true value that's here, the actual y. So I want to minimize the sum of these red lines. This is graphically, if you want to uh, visualize it. And formally or analytically, this is the formula. So um, we need to minimize, uh, we need to minimize uh, the, the prediction of sales on this specific example. We need to minimize the prediction of sales minus the actual value of sales. I wrote them in the matrix notation. So basically, I need to predict. Um, so the prediction is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times 1 plus beta 2 times 23. For the second row, my prediction would be 1 times beta 0 plus 2 times 2 la anno year 2 times beta 1 plus 26 times beta 2, and so on. So this is just a matrix notation. It's just um, the same formula here, but I wrote it in matrix notation. So what I'm gonna minimize is the difference between my actual sales, 651, 762, and so on, minus the predicted values, meaning that I wanna minimize this vector here minus this matrix multiplication squared. I know we're doing squared error. So without going into the details of math, the least squares method or the algorithm basically here would give me that beta, the, the, the coefficients I'm looking for, are basically equal to x transpose this matrix times x inverse times x transpose. The whole thing here we call it pseudo inverse times y. So probably you've taken it in math to 18. I don't know if, if you already know these the squares, but it, it's really well famous, uh, well known method in, in engineering and in, in mathematics. Um, for the sake of this workshop, we're just gonna use it. So now in the hands-on session, we will just um, use it in the SK Learn uh, library. So any questions till now? Uh, there are no questions. Okay. So if we do this computation in Python, MATLAB, or uh, by hand, if you want, uh, so if we do this computation, we would, uh, we would get beta 0 is equal to 323, beta 1 is equal to 47, and beta 2 is equal to 14, which means that my sales is equal to 323 times, uh, uh, times 1 plus 14 times advertising plus 47 times 0, meaning uh, that now if I have in year 12 and I have the amount of ad advertising I want to spend, then I can compute the sales. For example, um, in year 10, if the company spent 60 million euros on, on advertising, the predicted sales will be this amount. Okay? So by just computing these values, خلص, I have my model. My model now takes any input, and will output the uh, the sales according to the the input. Okay. Uh, are you ready to our first hands-on session? Yeah, I shared the link on on Drive. Uh, sorry, on uh, on chat. I'll I'll send it again. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's sent. Yeah. So basically, uh, you have view access to this link. You don't have edit access. So if you open the link, you're gonna. S uh, it opens Drive, not the link itself, right? Uh, when I checked it. shows uh, the CSV file and the two notebooks so oh. just make sure that um, you see this thing on your screen
Any problems? Okay, thank uh, I need you please to download this data set. So just right click and download. And we can open the first notebook as one underscore linear regression. If you're connected to your Gmail, if you're signed in uh, from your Gmail, you should see this. You just open with Google Collaborative. If it doesn't show here, it should be uh, shown here. Does anyone have any problem with this? Hey, but do you have a problem? Your link in particular isn't working, so if you could. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So once you open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So once you open the notebook, uh, you don't have edit access. So just put file, save, copy, and drive, so that you have your own copy you can use later on. We don't need everybody to uh, be working on the same notebook at the same time. So just save a copy and drive and work on this. Uh, on this copy. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to start with the S1, Jamal, the S1 underscore linear regression. So the S2 neural network is for the second uh, session. Okay. So um, can I start? Okay, just something for uh, just one thing for this uh, session and the next one. Uh, um, um, I wrote something. I wrote uh, some code for you, and I left some code uh, to be written during the workshop. Everything that we need to write has this specific comment with dash dash, so you know that this is where you should fill in uh, your code. Okay, so I'm gonna start first. We need some libraries uh, that already uh, that already provide the the algorithm and the, the models for you. First, I'm gonna import pandas. Pandas is just a library in Python that reads a CSV file or reads basically general uh, files, uh, so that we just load our data set. Uh, the matplot library is just for plotting. We need it to plot our data set and see it. The sklearn has a linear model uh, sub-library, if you want, that has the linear regression model. So everything is defined inside this class, which is important, import it. And finally, um, we just need this uh, uh, line to display the uh, plots directly in the notebook. So I'm going to run the cell. If you know Google Colab, uh, you just click on Shift Enter. Or yeah, shift enter to run a cell, or you just click on this on this button. Um, okay. So now to be able to uh, uh, to read the data set, we have many tools. We can either, if the data set is already in a certain link, it's hosted somewhere, we can put the whole link here. Or if it's in Drive, we can mount our uh, Google Drive and uh, look at it. Otherwise, we can click on this folder here. Um, and we can click on this button here to upload the data set. So I'm going to click on it, choose my desktop, and then it's here. So basically, if you downloaded it, it should be in your downloads. Just click on it up and, and upload. It will be here. So now I can use it. It's inside the runtime of Colab. Uh, whenever you, deal, you, you stop this Colab, and you want to open it again, you won't see the advertising.csv file. You have to upload it again. OK? So the first line here, it says pandas pd dot treat csv advertising.csv. So basically, I'm, just, I'm giving it a certain uh, parameter here to, to read the, to start reading from column zero. Uh, so I got my data set. To be able to view it, I just say data.head. Head gives me the first five instances of my data set. I'm going to run it. So in my data set, I have these five, the first five rows. Uh, let's say I have 230 TVs, blah, radios, bra, bra, uh, newspaper, and then 
I'll have my uh, sales. So basically, TV means the advertising dollars spent on TV in a single for a single product. The radio spent on radio, the newspaper uh, advertising spent on newspaper, and the output is the the sale uh, in in the market. Okay. So to to, to see our data set, uh, to better see our data set, we can click data dot shape or can write data dot shape. I'll get a, a shape of 200 by 4, meaning that I have 200 rows and four columns. So I have 200 of these rows, meaning that I have 200 um, instances that, or examples that I can learn from. And I have four columns, which are TV, radio, uh, newspaper, and the sales, which is the output I want to predict. Okay, now I have... Um, this, is, uh, this is just to get more insights about the data set. So I'm gonna create uh, three plots that uh, that the data set is basically 4D, right? I have four dimensions. I wanna know the sales in terms of TV, the sales in terms of radio, the sales in terms of newspaper, everyone, every uh, every figure uh, alone. So basically, I I just plot the points data dot plot. It's a scatter plot. Scatter means every dot, uh, yeah, every instance will be just one dot. The x-axis is the TV. It's already defined because uh, the data frame will, will know that TV is column one. The y-axis uh, y will be sales. Also, data frame knows that this, um, that this column is for sales. Uh, and plot it on the first figure. The second figure here will be radio in terms of sales, or basically sales in terms of radio. The third um, plot will be sales in terms of newspaper. I'm going to run it. So basically, we got these uh, plots here, sales in terms of TV. We can see um, the more I spend on TV advertisement, the higher the sales are. Same thing for radio and same thing for newspaper. Um, I have a question here. Um, which feature is it TV or radio or newspaper that highly affects the sales? Yes, so Hamza is saying TV. As we can see, it's almost always whenever I increase my TV sales, this, uh, my TV uh, advertisement, the sales are increasing. However, here in the radio, sometimes I increase the sales and the, uh, the, the advertisement and the sales are not increased. Let's say these points. Same thing for newspaper. It seems that the high, high, saline, high, say, a high advertisement will not affect the sales very much. So this is one of the first things that we can do to just see the data set, understand it better before going and do uh, and doing machine uh, machine learning. So we can have uh, we can uh, just ask many general questions on this data set. Is there a relationship between ads and sales? How strong is this relationship? Which ad type contribute to sales better? What's the effect of each ad type, and so on? So we can know somehow from the, the graphs, but with linear regression, we will be able to answer these questions uh, also better. So first thing that we, got, we, we, we do basically, as we said, we need to split our data set. So if you have any questions, please ask me. Okay. So how to split uh, the data set? By the way, you have the freedom to just watch or you can uh, run the code uh, along with me. Um, yeah, so uh, so for, for my data set, I need to, uh, so for now, data is just, is just 200 rows by four columns. It doesn't know that Y is the sales and X are the other features. I need to define this thing. So I define that X is data at these features, call it, these feature columns, and then TV, radio, and newspaper. So I'm just defining X. And Y will be the data, but for the sales column. Okay, come in. I could have written it like that. Okay. Um, once I define my X and Y, I need to split the data set. So to split the data set, we said uh, the, 
64 training, 24 validation, and 24 testing. Now we don't need the validation data set. I'm just going to try one model. So we just merge the training with the validation to be 80 and the testing to be 20. So I'm going to use the, remember here, I imported the train test uh, split function. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I imported here a function that uh, just does the split. So I'm going to use it, train test split. It takes x, it takes y, so it takes two vectors that you want to split. It takes a parameter called test size is equal to, I'm going to uh, put it as 0 0.2, so I need my test uh, percentage to be 20%. And it, we can give it a random state, uh, 42, because random in, in, is not really random, it's pseudo-random, so sometimes we need to put a seed. Uh, so just uh, just take it for now, okay? And this function returns for me, this function returns for me four values. First, it returns, it returns x train, x test. So for the first x, it returns two vectors. And for the y, it returns y train and y test. I'm writing X as big X because it's a matrix. It has three features. And I'm writing Y as small Y because it just has one column. And I'm going to run. So now we can print the shapes. The training is 160 columns with three rows. Uh, sorry, 160 rows with three columns. Also, the Y for the training has 160 rows. So for the training is 160, basically. And the testing is 40. The X. Definitely, it just contains three columns and the Y contains just one column. Okay? Okay. So, um, okay. so the simple uh, the uh, linear regression, as we said, it's Y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times X1 plus beta 2 times X2 and so on. The simple linear regression, it takes just one feature. So we're going to choose one of TV or newspaper or radio, and then we're going to use it. So this is why we call it simple linear regression. Um, as we said, Y is the response, X is the feature, but the zero, but the one are the parameters. So as we said in the slides, we want to minimize these values here. Uh, and the, the output will be beta zero and beta one. Beta zero is called the intercept, or this, you know, it's the value where my line uh, intersects with the y-axis, and beta 1 is the slope of this line. And these two values are enough to define a line as we know in math. So surprisingly, the code is super, super easy. It's just two lines of code, and we will have our beta 0 and beta 1 without uh, explicitly um, define the least squares and so on. So I'm just going to take the TV, because most of you answered that, the, that TV is the most influential feature in my input. So I'm just going to consider TV. So my x here will be the training data at just TV. So I'm just going to consider TV. And the y train definitely, it's all uh, it's only one column. So I'll consider it as it is. To initialize the linear regression model, I'm going to say, uh, let's say LM, linear uh, model, linear regression. So I imported it here, remember. So I just can um, use it. So I created my model. Inside this, we have the beta coefficients and the way it multiplies and everything. I'm just going to fit this model to my data. So I'm, say, I, I'm going to say lm.fit x, y. So fit means train. So whenever we say train, encoding, we will write it as fit. So this linear regression model fitted to our data set, which is defined inside my x and my y. x is the input, y is the output. And the input consists only of TV. I don't want to consider other inputs. Surprisingly, just these two lines of code, with just these two lines of code, I defined my linear regression model, and I trained it on my data set. Any questions till now? So. Once we train the model, beta 0 and beta 1 will be already uh, 
will be already defined or computed for us, I will access them using the beta zero, we call it inter intercept here, uh, with an underscore and a coefficient. Yeah, and beta one, beta two, beta three will be inside the coefficients. Let me run. So my beta zero is equal to seven. The coefficients beta one is only one. The matrix consists of one value. I just have one input, so my coefficients are just one value, and it's equal to zero point zero four. Okay. Any questions? How can we interpret these uh, values? A 0 0.004 meaning, uh, means that a unit increase in TV ad spending is associated with a 0 0.04 unit increase in sales. So whenever you spend $1 on TV advertisement, you will get $0.04 on, uh, in sales, okay? Or $1,000 spent on TV will give you a 47 uh, uh, in, in sales, okay? So my model will be this model, beta zero plus beta one, meaning that my sales are equal to this number plus this number times TV out. So now if I have a new, uh, a new uh, example, I can say, let's say uh, for sales, let's say I spent uh, 50 on, uh, on TV, I will say, the sales will be seven point this number plus if I spend 50 times this number. So I know that the sales will be this number. Okay? But also I can predict this number using the, the library that I use to make the predictions. So I can create a new data set which just consists of one instance where the TV is equal to 50. So I'm creating a new data set. I need to see the head. So it's TV 50. It looks like this without the radio, newspaper, and sales, and with just one column where the TV is equal to 50. And I just say simply lm.predict x new. The linear regression model will automatically know that I should multiply beta zero by one and beta one by 50 and add seven point something to it. So it will do the computation for us. And then we will be able to see that the, that the sales will be 9.44, the same number I got here with, with floating point uh, difference. Okay, any questions? All right. Um, so, now I need to plot this line that I was able to compute. So this is just a figure. I need to plot it inside Python uh, to, to see it uh, exactly. So for this uh, purpose, I created a new data set. I called it X boundary, which consists of TV with two values, the minimum value and the maximum value. So I want my line to spread the whole data set. So I just took the minimum value and the maximum value. X, uh, not had to see just a few instances of the data set. So I have two values, the TV is 0 0.7 and another uh, example where the TV is equal to uh, 200 or something. I need to predict what is the Y by the, by the linear regression model. So the linear regression would give me Y is equal to what for these two numbers. I say LM linear regression model dot predict. I give it this data set. It will return predicted boundary. So it will predict for the first item seven point something and for the second item it predicted 20. So let me plot the, the let me plot my data and let me plot the linear regression models. First I will say plt dot scatter as we said scattering and just put uh, plot them as point as points. I need my X train so my training data set just for the TV feature, and I just consider it TV, and the Y will be the Y train. So it will plot the my data set, and then I need to plot the linear regression output that I got. So I'll say plt dot plot. I need to plot two two uh, two just two. I know it's a line, so it's defined by two numbers, uh, by two points. So I just need to plot these two points as a line. These two points are basically my XBD 
and my predicted BD. predicted e and y uh, BD. BD. okay and the color let's say red and uh, the line with Okay, so the, the blue dots are plot using the first command here. So we, we plot our uh, training data set. The x axis was the TV, the y axis is the, the, the actual sales, and the linear regression I took. The boundaries, I predicted their rise using the linear regression model, and I was plotting the line in red. So as we can see, this is the best line that fits my data set. So this is the line that minimizes all these errors. Is that OK? Any questions? Any concerns? Is this a good or a bad sign? Everyone understands. Okay. Yeah. As we knew, and know, uh, if I get a, a good accuracy, that doesn't mean that I'm doing well. I need to see the performance on new data, data that's not encountered uh, during testing. So I'll do the same. I'm going to plot the same based on the uh, testing data. So instead of X chain, I'm going to plot X test. Instead of Y chain, I'm going to plot Y test. And the linear regression, definitely, it will be the same. So the model, I will not retrain it on the testing data. So just the same, the same line, based on a new testing data. And I will obtain this figure. So for the testing, so let's say I spent this amount on TV. The amount that I'm going to predict is this. However, the true amount is this. For this point, the amount that I will predict is here, and the true amount is here. So it looks like, OK, good. Um, for some points, it really fits the data. For other points, no, I have a high error. However, I have a linear model. So this is the best that I can do. I, I can't have a parabola. I can't have oscillations. So this, this is the best model that I can do with linear regression. Is this clear? OK. Um, I just have one. Uh, Ali, if you have um, a specific question. Yes, definitely. So with neural networks, let's say, we don't have the linear constraint. So we're having a more complicated model. And with linear regression, don't forget that with the linear regression, I'm just considering one uh, feature. I could consider the radio and the newspaper, and I would uh, obtain better uh, uh, predictions. Linear regression is one of the first, uh, the first uh, uh, algorithms that you that you learn do you accept yes i do uh Tara, we definitely do so uh please if you have any feedback that you'd like to give us or julia in particular then please do let us know Um, yes, Heba. We'll we'll uh, we learn that in, um, in in the second part of the workshop, Hala with neural network. But there is no uh, there is no clear answer for that. We need to try. So the model here is underfitting. Yes, I'm getting to underfitting, overfitting in the next part of the workshop. Uh, wait a few slides and and we'll get there. Atari, you're gonna say something now, or should I continue? Do you have any concerns? Uh, don't worry about it. I, you th I think you should continue and. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so for multiple, okay. So uh, for now we did just uh, linear regression with one simple feature. We can extend this to have more than one feature. We can take into consideration the newspaper and the radio. So um, 
uh, instead of having the featured columns, featured columns to just be TV as before, I will have, the t I will consider the TV, radio, and newspaper. I wish, you no, know, I'm not moving, moving fast, because you know, I need to cover a lot in, in these two hours. Uh, so I'm considering my X to be the data at these features, my Y to be the sales as before, and I'm gonna do the linear regression model as before, linear regression, and M plot fit X and Y. So these X and Ys. And I will print the intercept and the coefficients. As you can see, the intercept is one uh, value, and the coefficient is a list of three values, meaning that this is the coefficient of TV, this is the coefficient of radio, and this is the coefficient of newspaper. Okay, so uh, uh, this is what we get with, uh, with multiple uh, linear regression. We just need to consider x at more than one index, and uh, the SK learn library will do that for us. Okay, any questions? I don't think there are any questions so far. Okay, so we can start with neural network or you wanna take like two minutes break? I'm fine with both. Uh, if, you, if you guys wanna take uh, two, uh, I, I think we should, uh, two hours is a bit uh, much, a lot of people. Should we take two minutes break? Sure. Okay. All right, guys, so we'll be back in a couple of minutes. then please feel free to ask in the chat and we'll be answering them in the please go ahead um uh, i'm still here so if you have any questions i can take Uh, Ali, if you mean the language R, then uh, definitely you can. I uh, definitely know a lot of people who prefer to use R over Python. Uh, that's uh, at your discretion. Uh, Python has a lot of uh, very popular framework uh, that, are, uh, that I'm not sure R has as well, but uh, they're both very popular languages for... Yeah, I agree. It's better to take the risk and learn Python uh, as early as possible, even if you already know another program, another uh, computation uh, language. Uh, it's better to learn Python even for research. Everybody does the uh, research papers, uh, the experiments for research papers in Python. Uh, there are a lot of li libraries and uh, uh, whenever you have any problem in Python, you will definitely find a solution online. Uh, it, I don't know if it's the same with uh, with other languages or frameworks. Yes, so Jupyter Notebook is an IPython environment, meaning that uh, it runs in, in cells if you want. So if you have a problem in a certain cell, uh, you, you won't lose all the variables and all the computations you did before. So it's uh, definitely better than Python with, with the command line uh, interface. Uh, so Jupyter is IPython, Jupyter it runs locally, um, Colab is basically doing, uh, you, you run Jupyter Notebooks but on Google server, so you'll be able to use GPUs, CPUs uh, with a 24 hour limit I guess on, on the computation, so you can't have a computation that runs more than 24 hour limits, 
but everything that that runs on Jupyter Notebook definitely will, will run on Colab. And also, whenever you want to download something, it downloads um, according to Google server speed. So it, it really uh, downloads things fast. It has a lot of libraries that are downloaded for you. Just uh, import them. If you're running Jupyter on your laptop, you have to make sure that the libraries are installed on, on your machine. Um, should should we start? You're ready. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope that you don't have any questions on logistic on linear regression. If you have, please let me know before we proceed. Uh, the next topic will be neural networks. I need to install the library every time I use them. If I'm using Jupyter, no, you just install it once. It will be ready on your uh, on your machine. Whenever you want to use it, you can uh, you can use it. Okay. So my next topic is um, is neural networks. It's uh, one of the most famous machine learning uh, models. Uh, it's really well known and well used. And um, there is a theorem that uh, that that tells you that with neural networks, uh, you can approximate any function, even if it's super, super nonlinear, exponential function, very complicated function, you can approximate it with a neural network with enough layers and neurons. So people who like math and, um, and proofs, there is the theorem of universal approximation that tells you uh, this, this concept. So that's why neural networks are really famous. They can approximate really very complex uh, uh, complex functions. Uh, they, they, they're done to um, uh, imitate the way our biological brain works. So basically we do associative learning and they map the integrate and fire of the neuron, which is a biological uh, functionality. They map it into mathematical function that we can compute on our machines and use. So uh, the, the neural networks are really powerful uh, with enough layers, enough neurons. We'll, we'll discuss that uh, during uh, the, the, our, our next session. So if you want to define a neural network, we define it as a mapping between input and output, like any other model, machine learning model. However, um, this network will look like the cartoon version of the biological brain. So Michael Jordan, one of the most famous people in machine learning says that the neural network is really imitating the brain. However, it's still a cartoon version of the brain. We need uh, more complex functionalities and mathematical functions to be able to really model uh, the brain. However, we're on the right track. So we're, we're doing uh, modeling that looks like uh, uh, the brain. So uh, in a neural network, I have an input layer. I have one or many hidden layers. And the more hidden layers, the better. And I have one output layer. Each layer will consist of as many new, the neurons as I want. So basically, I can have n neurons. I'm here describing one neuron. So in the previous slide, this neural network, every circle here is a neuron. So every circle is doing this thing. What's this thing? It's basically taking inputs. These inputs get multiplied by weights. And we have the bias, which gets multiplied by one. It, it's, simil it's similar to beta zero that we had in the linear regression. So basically, Lacan, it takes input and it multiplies it by the weight. It adds to it a certain constant value B. All of this um, gets activated inside a function F that we call the activation function. And we get to F in maybe one or two slides. And then it, out, it fires or it outputs one output y. So y will be a certain weight times x1 plus a certain weight times x2. And if I have more inputs, then definitely I, the summation here which should be bigger. And I have plus b. So every neuron here is doing this computation. It's outputting something. This something gets inputted to the next neuron and so on. So it's really a complex comp computation that's, uh, that's done inside a neural network. It's somehow nearly linear, 
thus uh, the combination of all of these linear functions will not be linear and that's why neural networks can approximate nearly any uh, function with a certain uh, uh, error. So x1 and x2 are the inputs, y is the output, f we call it the activation function, I'll get to it soon, and w1 and w2 are the weights and beta is the b is the bias. So these weights are the one thing that I don't know. So the input is definitely known. The weights are not known. And why definitely no? So the whole thing, the whole aim of neural network is to compute these weights W1 and uh, W2. Once I compute these weights, then I have my model and my life is so much easier. I can just take input, produce output. So the weights W1 and, and W2 are similar to beta 1 till beta n that the linear regression model has, okay? The activation function, basically I have many activation functions. These are uh, the well-known activation functions and well-used activation functions. Let's say the identity function, uh, it outputs the same number. So here f of blah will be, you know, f of let's say five, it will be five. So it's, it just it does nothing and you know? it just returns the same number. Sigmoid, um, it has this uh, exponential formula. Basically the, the, va the, the values that are a bit high, it just maps them to one. The values that are a bit low, it just maps them to zero. So this is one of the activation functions that super famous in, in machine learning. We have uh, the rectified linear function, which uh, any number that's negative, it, it gives it as zero, and any number that posi that's positive, it gives it as it is. We have the, uh, the inverse tangent method come in that does pretty something like the, the sigmoid function. It's a bit different. So these are the activation functions. So like you're going to ask me, what's the best activation function to use? We can't know that. We have to try and uh, 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 compare the performance on the, on the validation data set, and we can choose the model that performs best. So there's no, there's no mathematical rules, uh, rule that tells me use sigmoid, don't use identity, and so on. Because I know sigmoid is really famous and people uh, use it, rectified linear also. So the question now, any question before? So the question now is how to compute these weights. Come in, one very famous algorithm in machine learning is gradient descent. Now, gradient descent has a lot of details inside it. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to explain the, uh, the idea behind gradient descent and how it is used. Keras implements it. We don't need to implement the details. Uh, we just use it. Now. Why do we need gradient descent? The question is first, what is a gradient and how is this related to machine learning? We know that the gradient measures how much the output of a function changes if you change the input by a little bit. So basically, I know that if I move in the negative direction of the gradient, then I will definitely be minimizing my function. So people who took optimization before or numerical computing before, know that. So basically, if I'm going to minimize a, a certain function, I just move along the direction of the negative gradient. So here is um, a representation of that. If I'm at this point, the gradient of uh, here of the parabola will be a line. So if I move along the negative direction of the gradient, I will be minimizing my function. So here, and then move along the negative direction, you minimize your function uh, better and better until you get to this point. Here, the gradient is zero. So if you move along the negative direction of the gradient, you will stay at your place. Then you know that you converge to the minimum. Okay. And why do I care about minimizing a function? I know at the end, I need to minimize my error or my cost function. So definitely, I'm doing minimize. And in, in, in machine learning, we're doing optimization. We're always doing a minimization of the function. So that's why we use gradient descent. So at every point, I compute the gradient, move along the negative direction, compute the gradient, move along the negative direction until I hit a point where I'm not moving anymore. So I know that I hit a certain minimum. Okay. Now the question, how should I move? Should I take a big step or a small step? What's the best step that I can take? There is also a trade-off. If I take a step that's too small, it might take me forever to converge. So here I'm moving really, really slowly, 
before uh, obtaining the minimum. So I don't want to take a really small uh, learning uh, step. At the same time, if I take a big learning uh, step, I might diverge. So I might uh, do, do weird things. I might not, I might not converge to the minimum uh, directly. Uh, so this is the trade-off. And also the question, how do we know what's the best learning grade? We don't, we need to try. But usually we start at the beginning of our algorithm, we start with a high learning rate. And as we go, we decrease our learning rate. This is also an advanced, if you want, an advanced concept. So for now, we just take um, a constant learning rate uh, that we are uh, we will, we will use uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, this, in the workshop. So um, we're not going to use the gradient descent as, as is. We call it the batch gradient descent. We're going to use a slightly different version called the stochastic gradient descent. So what's the difference between stochastic gradient descent and the gradient descent? Basically, gradient descent takes all the points in my data set, computes the gradient on all the data set, and then moves along the negative direction. This is not always feasible because I have two problems. This is first computationally expensive. So it will take me a lot of time to compute the gradient at each time at all the points. Hey, the uh, one, two. I can't keep all my data points in the in the RAM in the memory. So sometimes I deal with huge data sets. So I can't load all the data set to the memory. That's why we deal with stochastic gradient descent. That stochastic uh, means something that probabilistic. So basically, we sample from our data set a mini batch. We compute the gradient on this uh, using this batch. We move along the negative direction of the gradient, and then we sample another batch, move along the negative direction of the gradient, and so on. So I'm not computing the gradient on the whole data set at every uh, iteration, um, which, makes, uh, which makes it run faster. And uh, I don't think that the batch gradient descent is used. Uh, people usually use the stochastic gradient descent. So that's why I wanted to introduce the uh, SGT. Okay, any questions? Perfect. So to train a neural network, we have two main stages and you will hear the word forward pass and uh, backward pass a lot in, in training neural networks. So forward pass, I just compute the output at every neuron in a forward manner. So remember the first slide uh, we had, um, every neuron is uh, has an, an output that's fed to the next neuron and so on. So I need to do a forward pass where I compute the output of every neuron. And then once I get to the last, last layer, I have my predicted output. I compute the error. I compute the error, mean square error, let's say, so y hat minus y. And then I back propagate, we call it back propagation of the gradient. So I compute the gradient at each neuron and I update my weights. How do I update the weights using the gradient descent algorithm? So for now, um, I just want you to understand the, the general idea behind gradient descent. Doing the mathematical derivations uh, is, is really uh, time consuming. So I, I'm not covering it. So we, we don't need to go into the math details. We just need to understand the general idea. So if you have any questions about gradient descent in general, please um, let me know. So here I just uh, said that we need to compute the gradient of the error with, with respect to every weight. And once we compute this gradient, we update the weights as such. The weight at the iteration t plus 1 will be equal to the, the previous weight minus a certain learning rate, that the one that we said uh, it shouldn't be too small and it shouldn't be too large, times the gradient that we got. So we're moving along the negative direction of the gradient with a certain ratio alpha and we're updating our weights using this formula. Any question? Okay, I just have one simple comment. It's not simple, but for now you just you can you can take it as a simple comment. Computing this derivative sometimes it's not uh, easy. It has the chain rule, and I need to take into account many functions. And this is where calculus uh, comes along. But I don't want to cover that, and it will take really two or three hours to just explain the chain rule and how do we compute the gradients. For now, I just want you to understand uh, the, the general idea behind it. 
and uh, maybe with either later workshops or uh, on your own you can uh, you can learn about it okay so if you have any questions we can we can address them at the end of the of the workshop regarding gradient descent what's the importance of the backward pass okay so it's a good question basically first i initialized my network with random weights so i don't know what the good weights are and i did the forward pass i predicted the certain output definitely at, at first i will have a very big error i know my weights are, are just random so this error once i compute the gradient i need to update my weights so with every update i'm getting better and better weights meaning that i'm getting better and better model um that that has uh, a less error so it has a better error uh, than the previous uh, than the previous iteration so without this backward pass i'm not going to update my weights not updating the weights meaning that i have the random model at the, that i had uh, at first no i need to update my weights at every iteration in order to arrive at the best weights uh, at the end is this clear okay any question okay so uh, as i said luckily the the gradient descent algorithm and the stochastic one is basically implemented in keras uh, so whenever we use the fit function it automatically calls on the gradient descent it does it we don't need to worry about this so the pseudocode that keras implements is basically the following so it loops for many iterations each iteration we call it an epoch so we need to know the keyword epoch and we'll use it in the implementation so for epoch in range epochs for many iterations we do one forward pass it should have an s here we compute the error and then we use the gradients to update the weight in the backward pass so this is basically the uh, high level idea of uh, of training neural networks Keras implements this, we just need to call the fit function. Okay, so the questions that you might ask, how many layers should I have? How many neurons per layer? What's the best learning grade? And as I've been saying for the, uh, for the whole workshop, we don't have any rule that tells me you should use five layers with 15 neurons each. No, I should start with a certain number train my model, test it, arrive at a certain conclusion. Should I increase the number of layers or decrease the number of layers and so on? So it's basically by trial and error. There is no rule. But definitely, if I have um, a data set that's huge with images, with high dimensional images, then I would definitely know that I can't do that with just one layer. It has to be more complex. So I start with like 10, 15, 20 layers. If I have a simple data set, sales versus advertising versus um, the price here and so on, so maybe just one or two layers will be enough. So we need our own judgment, and then we'll have ways to know whether we should increase the model complexity or decrease the model complexity, and I'll get to that uh, soon. So as I said, there is no rule. Uh, these are called hyperparameters that need tuning. What do we mean by tuning? Meaning that we start with certain numbers, we assess, and then we change these numbers. Um, so basically, we, we, whenever we start with, with a certain uh, initialization or a certain uh, uh, network, we, we do it, we train on the training set. And then um, we validate, we get, let's say, a performance of 90% on the validation set. So I say, let me increase the number of layers. I increase the number of layers. I test on the validation data set. I get an accuracy of 93. So I throw the first model and then I say, let me increase the number of layers more. I increase the number of layers. I test on the validation data. I uh, receive an accuracy of 92, let's say. So I say, oh, OK, the second model is the best one. So I throw two models. I keep the model that has an accuracy of 93. And then I will test on the testing data. It has an accuracy of 90, let's say. I will report to the user the accuracy of 90. So the user, the user should know the accuracy on a, a, a completely new data set. The validation data set is for my own purposes to just know which model is better. Is this clear?
Okay. Now for the question on overfitting, underfitting, uh, it's a very important question and it's basically a very important concept in, in machine learning that we need uh, to know. So let's say my data looks like that and I want to try linear regression. The first thing that we should know that we shouldn't try linear regression. And my data itself is not, is not linear. Approximating it with a linear line will definitely be bad. So this is a model that's really simple uh, uh, in comparison to the data that I have. And in this case, if the model is simple and the data is complex, I, call, I, I, I say that the model is underfitting the data. So it's not a good fit, it's an underfit, okay? Uh, in this case, let's say, so my data looks like a parabola, so I'm fitting it with something that looks like a parabola. This, I can say about it as a good fit. So the data is definitely, I'll have some errors, but overall, it looks like it's really fitting the data well. So this is a good fit. This is a very good fit on the training data. So on the data that I have, I somehow have an error of zero. But I can't say that this is a very good model. Why? Because I'm overfitting to the data. So now if I have a new point, let's say my point is here, I, I should have a value here, it will be here. So uh, it's overfitting to the data that I am observing. For a new data set, it will not be good. So this is the trade-off between underfitting and overfitting. Uh, technically, I want to achieve this, but sometimes I increase the number of layers, I increase the model complexity, I become, uh, I, 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 uh, it will lead to a model that's overfitting uh, the data. So when we do achieve underfitting, if the, the data is complex and I just have one or two layers, so definitely I'm underfitting. Overfitting, if the data is okay and I'm doing 100 hidden layers, so it will, it will memorize the data that I have. It will not learn the patterns in the data. So this is what we call overfitting. How do we know? When are we overfitting? And uh, is there any question about uh, overfitting, underfitting before I, I proceed? Okay, so let's say I'm doing training for the network and I'm plotting the loss or the error. So loss and error are uh, interchangeable if you want. It's the same thing. I'm plotting the loss in terms of the epochs. So with more iterations, uh, I'm plotting the loss. So here, at the beginning, I have a high training error and a high testing error. So definitely I'm underfitting. Definitely I need something that's more complex. With time, I'm decreasing my training error a lot. So my training error is nearly zero, but my testing error started to increase, meaning that I'm really learning the model on the data set that I have. However, on new instances, I'm behaving super badly. So this is definitely overfitting here. The best model is here, somewhere here. So, okay, I'm doing well on the data I'm, I, I am trained on. However, also on new data, data points that I never saw before, I'm also doing well. So this is, this is probably this region here is good. Here is overfitting and here is underfitting. Same applies for the number of layers. So if I increase the number of layers and I'm getting higher testing error, then definitely I'm overfitting. If I'm inc inc uh, decreasing the number of layers, also I might be underfitting. So the good fit is here, somewhere where the train and test error are both uh, relatively low. Any questions? Okay. So let's move to the to the second hands-on session. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this is something good or bad that you're not asking questions. I hope that you already uh, are familiar with the, or you, you already understood the concepts. So I'll close this notebook. Please ask me any questions whenever uh, you have something that's not clear. So um, as we said before, open please at the S2 uh, net to a neural network dot IPYNB and uh, file, uh, save a copy and drive.
Okay. So uh, I assume that everyone is. Uh, do does anyone have any problem? One is following, I believe. Uh, yep. All good. So um, first, uh, as as before, I'll start with the libraries. So I'm gonna use uh, the data sets that are already exist. Uh, that uh, are, that already exist in Keras. Basically, we're gonna use the MNIST data set. Uh, to categorical, hala, we'll, we'll explain what does it mean. Uh, for the models, I'll be using the sequential model. This is the same as a neural network. So neural network in Keras is called a sequential model. The neural network layers in Keras are called dense layers. So I'm importing them to just use them. Uh, definitely, I'll import the PyPlot uh, Pi library, and I, am, I will import NumPy as NP. Please add here as NP. OK. For, for loading the data, I'm not going to, for the first uh, session, we uploaded our data sets, uh, our data set uh, ourselves. So now we're just gonna use the data set that's uh, that's in uh, wait. So we're gonna use the data set that's already defined uh, for us in in Keras. So uh, it will take a lot of time to download MNIST data set from the internet and then use it, uh, you, uh, upload it. I will uh, just call it from. Uh, MNIST, already load, I already loaded MNIST here, dot load. So load data will return X train, uh, uh, Y train, comma, another tuple of X test, Y test. This is the way uh, the load. This is the thing that the load data function returns. So see, it's uh, it's a big data set and it downloads uh, super fast because we're running on on Google server. So now we have the training data set and the testing data set. I want to. I just wrote one few lines of code that uh, let me see uh, my data set. So I just want to visualize it. So basically, I'm plotting sixty four images. Uh, for each image, I'm getting a random uh, index. Um, I'm just plotting as an eight by eight image. Let me run this code. So, so this is the MNIST data set. So randomly, I'm plotting for six, eight. These are random uh, digits from the X train, from the training data set. Okay. So next I'll train, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, print the X train dot shape, the X test dot shape. So I have 60,000 images, which are 28 by 28 for training. And I have 10,000 10, images, which are 28 by 28 for testing. So in the slides, and for now, we don't know how to deal with two-dimensional data. So my input should be a vector, OK? And that's why I will flatten, um, I will flatten my input. So I will transform the 28 by 28 image to a one vector of size 28 times 28. So I'd say x train is equal to x train dot key shape. Uh, what's the new shape that I want? x train dot shape at zero. So I don't want to, re to reshape the 60,000. It should still be 60,000. However, the second dimension should be 28 times 28, which is the image vector size. I do the same for X test. I'm keeping the 10,000, and instead of having uh, 28 uh, times, uh, by 28 as a 2D matrix, I'll have it as one. Okay, so hala, if we print, let's say, x train dot shape, we'll get 60,000 by 784, which is 24 by 24, versus 60,000 by 28 by 28. Okay, 
second thing that we have now our um, y is basically either zero or one or two or nine. So the main the, the, the thing here is that if my algorithm predicts one uh, eight, and uh, however it should have predicted zero, it's wrong to say that the model is off by eight. So it's wrong to say that my error is eight. Uh, this is not higher than the error if the model predicts seven, where it should predict eight. So here the error would be one. So there is no like relative difference between these uh, predictions. It's wrong, خلص. If it's one, it should be eight. It's wrong. It's not wrong by eight or seven or whatever. So that's why in these cases, we deal with what we call one hot encoding. And this is very famous in machine learning. You'll see it a lot. So uh, whenever I have multi-class uh, uh, classification, I transform my classes into vector. Let's say I have 10 classes, so I have a vector of 10 uh, values. I just have one in the class that there, where sh there should be a one and zero otherwise. So I'll just do it, and then you will see uh, what I mean. So basically, I am transforming Y train. That's where I used to categorical. I said, uh, no, we're going to use it later. Um, so we're transforming the Y train num classes, which is 10. I'll do the same for Y test. So categorical Y test. Um, So in this case, I'm and, and then I printed the Y train for the first five instances. Notice that the Y of the first instance is this one. So it's not a zero, it's not a one, it's not a two, not a three, not a four, it's a five. Here it's a zero. Here it's a uh, whatever, four, two, a one, or so, and so on. So basically the error, خلص, if I have a one in its correct, in its uh, wrong position, then this means I have, an, mathematically, this means I have an error. It doesn't mean that my error is eight or seven or whatever. So that's why we do one hot encoding. Is there any, uh, any problem? Munir, can, can you see the code now? Uh, uh, no, we, we can, okay. So in this case, when we build our net neural network, you will see that no, we don't need to reshape. Uh, we will have a specific neuron for every uh, output. Just um, wait a few minutes till we build the model and then I'll, I'll explain it. Okay? So uh, now, uh, the neural network that we're considering basically um, it has an input, this mark, this vector of 28 times 28, which is 784. So I have to have 784 neurons in the input layer. I can have as many hidden layers as I want. And in each hidden layer, I can have as many neurons as I want. And my output, now I'm answering the question of Jalal, my output would have 10 neurons. Every neuron will predict a probability. So the first neuron will predict a probability for this digit to be a zero. Second neuron will predict a probability for this digit to be a one. Third neuron for this digit to be a two and so on. So I have 10 neurons, each neuron predicting a probability for this input to be this specific uh, digit. And that's why we did this hot encoding. So this, uh, so my my whole output will be, what you know, will be this vector. So if I have this vector, I know that my 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 output is ten. But the neural network will probably output this whole vector. It would not output ten or nine or eight. That's how we deal with uh, discrete uh, values in uh, in uh, encoding. Okay, so um, I specified here the image size to be 28 by 28. I specified the number of classes to be 10. Remember, the neural network was, uh, before with linear regression, we said model is equal to linear 
regression. Remember? Now, I don't have a linear regression model. Instead, I have a sequential model. So sequential means, and no, it's a neural network. And then I, for, for every layer, I need to add it explicitly to my model. Okay? It's clear. So the first thing that I want to add is the input layer. Uh, I need to add a hidden layer, sorry, model dot add dense, meaning that it's uh, 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 for now we just learn dense layers. We have convolutional layers, CNN, recurrent layers, and so on. But you don't, you know, it's beyond the scope of, of this workshop. Units, meaning that I, uh, how many neurons should I have? So I have 32 neurons. Let's say I can have 15 neurons, I can have 15 neurons. Uh, it's, it's a number that we just specify and then we can change later. Activation function, remember the activation function we said sigmoid is widely used. So I'm gonna use sigmoid as the activation function. And the input shape is equal to image size. So I'm telling that this layer has 32 neurons and it's connected to a layer before it, which is the input that has the 28 by 28 uh, as uh, uh, as size. Okay, but uh, I, I, I put a comma, uh, meaning that I can have many as many rows as I uh, want. And then, so now I have this input, and I have a dense layer of 32. I just need the output layer. So the output layer would be also a dense layer. How many units does it have? It just has 10 units, so num classes. Each unit or each node computes the probability of this input to be this specific digit. And the activation is equal to softmax. Hala Clear, any questions? So what's the difference between softmax and sigmoid? As a you know, research or by trial and error, people say that the hidden layers should have a sigmoid activation function. The layer at the end that prints the probability will have a softmax activation. This is uh, softmax basically uh, at the end will, will give you the probability of the, sorry, the label that has the highest probability. So it will, it will um, output numbers where, whose sum is equal to one. So it's designed specifically for the last uh, layer. Okay. I'm gonna run. So now I have the model. I can print it. Model dot summary. Uh, should we have someone chat if, if 32 is the number of uh, nodes in the layer or the number of hidden layers? No, it's the, no okay. So it's the number of units, meaning nodes in, in the hidden layer. If you want 32 layers, you have to write this code, this line, 32 times. We'll see in, at the end how to, to, to add uh, more layers. So each layer has a specific line of code. I need to, uh, to add it uh, alone. Since the output layer units are 10. Yes, so the layer, I have one output layer, which is this one, which has 10 neurons inside it. Clear? So now I printed the summary of the model. It says my model is sequential. I have one dense layer, which takes as which has thirty-two in, uh, inputs, and I have one dense layer, sorry, thirty-two neurons, which has ten neurons. These are the neurons at the end. I also have a total parameters of twenty-five thousand four hundred fifty. So remember those weights we talked about. Why not? So see how many connections we have now. Um, oh. So every connection here has a weight. And these weights are the, the things that I want to compute. So I have 25,000 weights in the connections between the input and the hidden and the hidden and the output. So that's a lot. And we just fit it will compute all these weights. I don't need to worry about partial derivatives, about computing derivatives. Everything is done inside the fit function. Any question till now? 
Great. Okay. So for now, I have a model. I didn't say that I want to uh, to use the stochastic gradient descent yet. I didn't say that I want to use the mean square error or the cross uh, entropy error. I didn't specify that I want the, to compute the accuracy of the model. All of this should be specified inside the function called model.compile. The model.compile takes something called optimizer. Optimizer for me, I'm going to use sequential uh, stochastic gradient descent, the one that we took in slide. Uh, probably later you would say you would see here the Adam optimizer. It's uh, it's yani, well used. It's used more than the stochastic gradient descent. But for the sake of this workshop, we're we're good with with uh, uh, good with uh, with SGD. Loss is equal to categorical cross entropy. Uh, remember the error that I said. This is a fancy version of the error. Uh, surprisingly, it does well, so we usually use it. And matrix that I want to report is the accuracy. So, uh, is my yani how how uh, how what's the percentage of times that my model is really doing good? So accuracy inside as an array, and I, know I can have more than one metric. Okay. So uh, now that we compiled uh, the model, we're ready. So now Keras know that, knows that I need to use the stochastic gradient descent, knows that this is the kind of loss I want to use, knows that I need to, uh, to use the accuracy and so on. So I just need to train my model. Training the model, middle, bill, linear regression, we can just use it simply uh, by the function fit. So if I say model.fit, I give it my training data. Remember, not all the, the data that I have, just the training data. Why train? I will give it about size. Remember when, when you said that the stochastic gradient descent takes at each iteration a small amount of data? So this is defined by the batch size. I'm taking, let's say, at every iteration, just take 128 instances and uh, uh, compute the gradient on these instances. If you notice, we use, I, I'm here using 128 before I used 32. So usually, usually we do, uh, whenever we choose our numbers, we choose them as uh, powers of two. And this is for caching issues. And uh, I'm sure if you're a computer scientist, you would know this best. Uh, I just wanted to highlight it. And we need to train for five epochs, which is really nothing. Uh, usually we train for much, much more. Um, epoch is every iteration where we do the gradient. So five is really small, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna train it on uh, five um, five epochs. I'm gonna use verbose is equal to verbose is uh, means that if verbose is equal to zero, then don't output anything while you're training. Verbose is equal to one. Output something while you're training to tell me where you are. Verbose is equal to two, and output all the details of your training. So I'm going to see the details that, uh, that Keras is doing. So I'm specifying verbose is equal to two. And the validation uh, split is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whatever. So I, ha already I already split my data into train and test. The validation, Keras can do it for me while training. I don't need to, uh, to split it before. Okay, so this will train the model. Hala, once I train the model, something is, is going on. So at, e at every epoch, I have a certain accuracy, I have a certain loss, and so on. So not to lose this data, I save it in a vector called state. The model.fit will do the fitting, will do the training, and will return a history of all the accuracies and losses along the way. Is this clear? Can any other layer have less neurons than the last layer? That's a good question, Heba. Thanks for highlighting it. Uh, what we do usually is we start with large, with layers with many neurons, and then we start decreasing the number of neurons um, uh, while we proceed. So let's say we start with um, 128 neurons, 64 neurons, 32, 16. So we decrease the number of neurons. 
بس it's not a good uh, design uh, issue إنه we have a layer that has neurons more than the output. No, it should have يعني the last layer should have uh, neurons more than the output uh, layer. Okay, so now uh, we're doing the training and all the details will be saved in the history. So I'm gonna evaluate, uh, I, I wrote this, this part for you, we're just using, but I'm, I'm gonna explain it. So uh, after fitting the model, training the model, we need to test. So I just say model.evaluate on the testing data set, which is the X test, Y test. There was is equal to false, I don't wanna know any details. And save the values in loss and accuracy. So I'll be uh, knowing the accuracy of the model on the testing data that's not encounter, encountered during training. Remember here, I didn't say X test nor Y test. So I'm just evaluating and then I'm plotting the accuracy, the validation accuracy. Uh, I'll just, uh, we'll, see. We'll, we'll see. Let me run. So as we can see, lambda variables is equal to two. It's plotting an epoch one. Uh, the loss was that many, the accuracy was 59, the validation loss was Gaza, the validation accuracy was 79, and so on. And as you see, the second epoch, the validation accuracy was 79, second epoch started 86, and then 89, and then 90, and then 90.88. So with the, the more epochs, I'm getting better and better accuracy. Here, I, I, with, with this code, I am plotting the accuracy, versus the number of epochs. So I'm starting with really low accuracy and then my accuracy is increasing. And if I train it for more epochs, for 50 epochs, I'm, I, I will definitely get an accuracy higher, even higher than 90%. And it's surprising with that, with only five epochs and with super few seconds, Yani, um, and my training data is huge. I have 60,000 training data. I'm getting this good accuracy. So on the testing data that's not encountered during training, my accuracy is 88.5%. So uh, uh, that's, if I wanna guess randomly at the chip, I would get an accuracy of 10%. So with this, this small amount of training, I'm able to arrive at an accuracy that's eight or, 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 or nine times better than the random guessing, which is really good. Even with, with more training, I will get to a better accuracy. And remember here, we're flattening the input. So we're already losing some spatial, uh, spatial information. So uh, we're not using convolution neural networks and so on that are uh, really more advanced. Okay. Um, for the testing, any questions? So I'm gonna take like, five to 10 minutes and it will be done. So we'll not take uh, more time. Uh, but I think what, what, what's gonna be covered next is, uh, is interesting. So just five minutes. Yeah, so I need to test the model that I get. Uh, here I, uh, I need to, to get a certain, uh, a certain uh, testing instance, so. What I did here is I did, I took the X test, I took the fifth instance, it could be the first instance, anything. So it's just a random number. And I reshaped it to a 20, in Anohon we reshaped the testing into a vector. So I reshaped it into a 28 by 28 image and I wanna see it. So I'm getting this number. So that the fifth testing or the sixth testing instance is basically one. The first one, the second one, let's say it's a two. So, um, so it's a one. The actual label, if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna plot, uh, print it, is basically, is basically this number as a one hot encoding, yani it's one. So the actual label is one. Uh, if I'm going to, let me, if I'm going to write the actual label, label not as, uh, Uh, 
on, I'm getting the arg max, which is the index of the maximum value. It's basically one. Okay. Here I predicted the x test. So I'm the, I just use the model dot predict x, te x test, and I will print the probability that I got. So I will do predictions at idx. Let me. So the probabilities are this number for zero. It's a very low probability. 0 0.094 to be one. Um, this probability to be two. This probability to be three, and so on. So if I get the 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 index that has the highest probability, so np dot argmax. I will get a one. So it predicted the true uh, label um, uh, correct. Any questions? Everything's good, I believe. Okay. So now, um, uh, for, for, for tuning on many layers, I'm not gonna run this code. I'm gonna show you the final code. Um, This one, I just uh, will share a key the final uh, notebooks with you because I don't want to waste time on writing the code. Basically, I prepared a code that tries to uh, run the neural network on different number of layers and different number of neurons per layer, and it plots the uh, the accuracies for you to, to to check the best model. So basically, here I created a function called create dense. It creates what, the first dense layer and then for as many layer as I'm passing, so I need five layers, so it goes and creates five in a for loop, five dense layers. So this is how we can create more than one layer. I can't specify a, a parameter. I need to write the same command five times, and then we'll add the last layer. And then here we do the same, uh, if I compile or fit to evaluate. And uh, we can see, I, I, I ran this code before, so basically, let's say here I have just two layers, I got this accuracy. Here I have three layers, I get this accuracy. I have here four layers, I'm getting better and better accuracy. Um, let's say one with, with uh, I, I don't know, for five layers, I'm getting really bad validation accuracy. So with this, I can evaluate my model and maybe say and this is that this is the best model and then use it. So you can try with this code alone and you can modify it and, and play with it. I still have uh, very few slides there, just uh, information, not, not technical slides. So if you have any questions about the technical uh, part, please ask. Okay, so before we leave, I just wanted to highlight a few things about machine learning that I think are uh, problematic and uh, challenges in, in AI. First, I wanted to say that deep learning, although we know that deep learning is really famous and it's, it's not something that's easy. However, it's really based on the same concept of neural network with two main differences. First difference is that we have a lot uh, more of um, uh, hidden layers. So not just five, some, hidden, some really deep networks have Hundred, uh, hundreds and two hundred uh, hidden layers. So I have a lot of hidden layers. This is one thing. And the connection or the, the mathematical formula that I used to, to map from input to, uh, to output could have convolution, could have some residuals. So I might have something that's mathematically more complicated. But it's the same concept as neural networks, just more advanced. So I really encourage you to go and learn about deep learning. You already have the ground now with neural network. Uh, oh, uh, the other, yeah, increasing the number of layers or increasing the complexity of the mathematical model will, will be uh, somehow easier now. Uh, second thing I wanted to say about the challenges of AI. So don't think that this is like um, La Vie en Rose with AI. We have many computational issues with AI. So uh, in, in 2019, a study said that uh, training a, a really deep network, which is transformer, one of the state-of-the-art networks, um, uh, does a CO2 emissions that's roughly equal to the total lifetime of five cars. So it's really uh, computationally expensive in terms of, of resources and time. 
uh, we have a problem in data scarcity. So sometimes uh, data is not available. Sometimes data is really hard to get or it's, uh, it has privacy issues. Uh, we have a problem in bias. So if we train, uh, I'm going to show an anecdote uh, here with uh, Google Photos, let's say in 2015, um, they did um, uh, automatic tagging of photos. So uh, one of the computer programmers uh, who's black, who's a black person, uh, was tagged as gorilla he and his girlfriend so this was like really a problem for for google um, uh, back then so if if the model is really not trained on on images of black people for facial recognition they will not recognize black people as uh people they might uh, maybe here uh, be confused with with other uh labels so this is really uh, important not to have biased models, not to choose our data set in the correct way. And finally, privacy is really an issue. Somehow our, our data is on, is, on, is on the cloud. Everybody is using our data. Where is the privacy in, in all of this? And um, federated learning, which will be maybe um, the next workshop, will deal with, uh, with, with the privacy. So for now, I'm, I'm done. Uh, here's my email if you have any questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the workshop. And if you have any questions, let me know. And now I leave the floor uh, for Omar. All right. Uh, Julia, for the session. Uh, I'm sure everyone learned a great deal of, about machine learning, and I hope a lot more has been cleared up about what machine learning is. I've had many people ask me about what machine learning is and how they really just don't understand anything about it. So I hope, hope so. That, yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, what we're going to do next. So, so this is the track we've been having for now. Uh, I've talked about um, the MENA GCP crash course before. So what this is is, and um, again, so for those who didn't join the WhatsApp uh, group, we'll be providing the link for that at the end, just later in a minute. So uh, the, the GCP crash course uh, just goes along with our events as well, and uh, we follow the same themes. So you go onto Quick Labs, and we provide a free Quick Labs subscription for the members of DSCAUB. Uh, we'll give more details about that in a minute. Um, so. These uh, are the quests that you have to complete there uh, if you want to qualify for the gift we mentioned last session. Again, uh, more details will be um, communicated about this uh, on the groups and in later sessions. But um, uh, this track in particular is almost done. So what we'll do is uh, we're going to be announcing our next track soon, which is um, conveniently about machine learning. So right after data, data science, we have a machine learning track, which is basically the same idea, uh, five quests that you complete on Quick Labs um, that pertain to machine learning. So you get to practice on the Google Cloud Platform um, with TensorFlow and Keras, so pretty much all of the, the, the tools we worked on in this session, which is very great, uh, as well as uh, other tracks coming in the future covering a lot more things like Flutter, uh, web development, and so on for uh, all types of uh, computer science fields. Uh, now, if you could go to the next slide, please. OK, so this is the, the platform that uh, we keep mentioning uh, time and time again on every platform that we have, uh, because this is really the center. So uh, once you join here, you get notified by email. Uh, you get access to all of our social media accounts. So you see the Facebooks, uh, the Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram links over here, uh, right, on the session, right on the page. So you get to join here, and you get notified whenever we have any future events. So uh, one event in particular that we have is uh, that's coming right after this session. This session, so next week, is going to be uh, hosted by uh, Dr. Peter Kairouz, which is a who's a Google employee uh, in the U.S. And we're really um, excited and uh, glad that he could join us uh, next week. So uh, we'll be sure to let you know uh, more details about that session um, once we're done with this one. And um, he's going to be talking about, as Julia mentioned, about. Um, federated learning, which is a, a, a bit more of an advanced topic in machine learning. So we had to make sure um, we cover the basics first so that uh, Dr. Kairouz can just uh, go wild and uh, cover um, his particular topic uh, with more detail. So uh, for all of that and more, uh, 
spe specifics about the Quick Labs subscription, the free Quick Labs subscription, um, the future events, and everything else. We'll be communicating it over the WhatsApp group. So please, if you're not already in the group, uh, you just have to scan this uh, QR code. You just open WhatsApp, and then you open camera from within WhatsApp. And you just point it at this QR code, and it will take you to the group um, directly. So that's pretty great. And um, these are the remainder of our social media uh, presence. Uh, you can join us through these links. And so we have Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And we're also going to be posting this um, session on YouTube, on our YouTube channel as well. So let me just post that uh, link really quickly. Because it's not included in here. It's a fairly recent thing. So all of our sessions are recorded in case you missed part of it or uh, if you couldn't attend. So you can just go through here, go to the channel that I just posted in the chat, and we'll be posting it, posting this session in particular very soon as well as all of our remaining sessions, which is very cool. So yeah, that's going to be it for today. Thank you guys very, very much for attending and uh, for you guys in particular for uh, sticking around to the end. Uh, if you guys have any questions to Julia or me, uh, about the club or about the session in particular and uh, any details about uh, the session or the club um, make sure to ask them in the chat so thank you guys very much you have any questions I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad thing. <laughs> Some people just uh, are too shy, even on chat. So, um, sure, you can. You definitely can. Uh, thought it. Yes, you can join the club. Or if you mean, if you're, if you mean that, um, like for non AUB students, you definitely can. So it's open to everyone, not just AUB students. So, okay. So how? Just going to give you the link to the page really quickly. That's great. So even if you're an, an alumni or um, not an AB student at all, or just not in Lebanon entirely, uh, you can still join, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to give you guys the link to the, the page. And um, if, you, if you didn't join the group earlier, the link was on the group, so the, the WhatsApp group, that is. So you can join there as well, and you'll also be notified of uh, all of our events. So OK, so here's the link. So that's where you join. If you're in the WhatsApp group, then you should have the link just fine. I think it's in the description somewhere. Oh, well. Yes, there's a WhatsApp group. So um, actually, let me share screen myself while we're at it. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys can see my screen. So this is the link to the WhatsApp group, uh, the QR code to the WhatsApp group. So you just scan this through WhatsApp. So inside of WhatsApp, there's a camera uh, tab or um, button uh, down at the bottom or at the top if you're using e uh, Android, and you just scan this, and you're in. OK. So I hope you managed to scan that. Any more questions? OK. OK. Uh, if you didn't scan, so what you do is you, um, if you opened uh, WhatsApp, if you open the camera inside of WhatsApp, what you do is you just point your camera at this QR code. And you should be able to, it'll show you a link to enter the group. And if not, I'll just uh, paste a link, actually. Maybe that'll be easier for you guys. Um, 
Let me just post a, a direct link to the group that way. So that would be, let me just find it really quickly. Okay. So, okay, cool. Awesome. Great. And for everyone else, well, it's working properly now, but anyway. Um, all right, awesome. So thank you guys so much for attending. Thank you, Julia, for the session. And uh, we hope to see you guys uh, in our future events. Bye-bye. Yeah,